It is March. Where's this year going? We're still in lockdown. Things haven't changed, but schools go back tomorrow. Today, we are going to talk about back to basics. And the reason that I've picked this topic particularly is we have talked quite a lot about machines, activity, exercises. But what I want people not to forget is the basics. And that is exercise of some form, be it sport, activity, play, or bog standard exercises. Stretches need to be done. If you're not doing them, you may need to start. And splinting, and I know splinting is a bit of a no-no for adults, but if you're going to a neuromuscular center to have your wrist diplam, then I think it's justifiable that they look at you as a whole and to get the best out of the treatments that are available that people, um, the consultants, the drug companies, anybody think that this is a total package. This is not just about giving you um, a package load of drugs or injecting some drug into you or giving you gene therapy, but it is about the whole caboodle. Now, I know there's a lot of talk about gene therapy starting in the UK for SMA. And again, uh, many of the trials that have been done, particularly in the States and in Italy, particularly in the USA, packed in a load of physiotherapy along with all the rest. And we don't get it in this country. Those of you who are watching from abroad and think everything is all wonderful and hunky-dory in this country, we don't get a lot of input. And I have no beef with community physios in the UK. They are stretched to nothingness. Um, I think there are some very good private physios out there. I also think there's a few rubbish ones. But generally, it is really important to look at the basics. Now, one of the things I was asked to do was talk about, let's go back to basics because we're going back to school tomorrow. And if your child or you, if you're a teenager, or if you're a teacher, because I know we have some SMA teachers out there, and you haven't been doing your exercises for weeks and weeks and months and months, you will find school quite exhausting and fatiguing. And you may find that merely the traveling to get there is a whole new ball game. Instead of falling out of bed at quarter to nine, switching on the Zoom and being ready to start school at nine o'clock. So we have to take into account everything that's going on. So it's not just about what you haven't been doing during lockdown, but if you've been very busy during lockdown, doing lots of stretches and exercises and all sorts of wonderful things over lockdown, then you're not going to get that opportunity when you have to get up two hours earlier, travel to school, come home exhausted. All you want to do is flop into the corner of a settee or recline your wheelchair plonk yourself in front of your xbox or your television and do nothing for the rest of the day and that is perfectly understandable we know more than anything that the biggest problem in sma is not pain it's not muscle damage it's fatigue and you're going to find that for a few weeks of going back to school the children are really exhausted so where do we fit the physio in that is more difficult. And this is where if school can fit it in, so much the better. And if school can't fit it in, the idea would be to fit it in, as we've always said, around daily activity. Now, daily activity includes helping, helping to get yourself dressed, helping to sit yourself up, helping to clean your teeth, to get your breakfast, to cut up your food instead of waiting for mommy to do everything instead of waiting for mommy to zip you up or do a button give it a go the fact that it doesn't work does not make it useless the fact it doesn't work is more important if you've tried and it hasn't worked than if you never tried in the first place so one of the things that is really important to think about is every time your child is helped to do something 
without trying to do it first. Now we know some things are impossible. I'm not saying they have to do their own transfers. We know the impossible is impossible. But every little thing that you do for them that they may at least assist with is taking away an opportunity to exercise in a time when you are going to reduce the amount of exercise you can be doing during the week. Now, I know there are families out there who've been really, really proactive during lockdown. And I know there are many families who are not sending the children back to school because they are still going to be shielding until the end of March. But that's only two weeks or three weeks. And we're still going to have to think about getting back to school after Easter. So where are the big problems in the work that we do during school that makes us tired? and what sort of things can we be doing? Now, one of the things that obviously you're doing a lot of at school is either writing or typing. And posture, shoulders, head control are really important. So the first thing, if you have not been in school for some time, is to get your OT mobilized and make sure you're seating, that you haven't grown, that you haven't changed, that your back hasn't changed, you haven't had a new spinal jacket, and your seating is no longer 100% right for you because you cannot sit and concentrate if you are not comfortable, if you're not well supported, if your head's off to one side. And because the levels of fatigue will be bigger, you need to make sure that you can sit for a lesson without flopping to one side or your head falling over or doing the old trick of hand on head on hand for half your lessons, which not only makes your wrist ache on that side, but also in effect takes away the use of one hand. One of the things that we are keen on, particularly for younger children, it's crazy as it sounds, is typing. We actually at times prefer typing to writing for two reasons, two main reasons. Firstly, when you're typing, you're using both hands. So it's not a case of just using one hand and one hand then is going to fatigue. It makes you more symmetrical. And in making you more symmetrical, it improves your posture. Because if you're, you twist to write, which most of us do, if you're twisting to write, then obviously it is worse for your posture. So generally we do advocate using typing at least in part during lessons. So children who are struggling because they want to write everything or they're being asked to write everything should be allowed to type a certain amount of lessons, a certain amount of homework and not be expected to do lots and lots of writing. Writing is really fatiguing for shoulders. Why shoulders? Because if your hands are weak, and the beauty of SMA fingers is many children have these wibbly wobbly fingers, you know, the ones that can never stick Lego together because every time you do anything with them, they bend backwards and do all sorts of strange things. And when you have those sort of weak bendy hands to stabilize a pen, normally you would pick up a pen and it's fairly stable in your hands. But if it's not stable, when you get to the piece of paper and all the joints in your fingers keep bending in strange places, then what you end up doing is using a lot more shoulder to stabilize the pen at the paper end. So there's a lot of this. And then when you've got a lot of this, because that shoulder's working really hard to stabilize your arm, and then your head goes that way. And then when you're writing, you're beautifully asymmetrical and you've got all this tightness going on down here. And then that gets achy. And I do know that quite a lot of people who do a lot of writing do get achy one way or another. People who are doing activities where they're using one hand predominantly and the brigade who do this, because there's plenty of you out there, because we see it, this is, not just a teenage thing, this is an adult thing and this is a child thing. When we get tired, we get here. So that we need to think about the shoulders and shoulders are fairly easy to move. The problem is what you're doing with your head when you're moving your shoulders. Because actually shoulder exercises, they're quite easy. You can push your shoulders back, you can push your shoulders down. Children have no concept of that. One has to say when you are little, everything is up here and there and they don't realize 
that actually they can push them down and push them back. And that exercise we've talked about quite often where you're sitting against the back of your chair, pushing your head and shoulders into the back of the chair is something they should all be encouraged to do regularly to relax the neck muscles and to stabilize and improve shoulder posture. Because when you get stuck here, it is very, very uncomfortable. And actually, let's get real, your lungs actually come all the way up to the top here. So when you're here, you are restricting the upper lobes of your lungs. So when you actually are opening up your collarbones, pushing down your shoulder blades, you are opening up those top sections of your lungs, which is good for your singing, good for your karaoke, and generally good for your breathing. So that we can do shoulder work. We don't have to lift our arms up in the air to be able to do our shoulders. Now, again, we have talked about this. There are two parts to your shoulders. There's the shoulder joint, which is where your arm sticks in and where it moves backwards, forwards. There's plenty of things you can do. With the old idea we were talking about of sliding, with crawling, many children and young people use crawling and you end up crawling up something to lift your arms and you can do that. Do it as an exercise, do it as a game, do it up your face if you wanna pick your nose, whatever you wanna do, use your arms. So that's your shoulder joint, but your shoulder girdle is your collarbones and your shoulder blades which come together here and that is a whole different ball game and that is more related to posture and stabilizing your neck and your upper trunk. So you can be working teenagers, adults, those of you who spend hours and hours at a keyboard during the day, all this wonderful working from home. But that is something basic. It's not a machine, you don't plug it in. This is what we're trying to get away from. Just sitting in a chair, you can do exercises. So then we can look at further down the arm, basic exercises. When we're on a keyboard, let's get real. Hands are palm down the whole time. When we're on a phone, we're in mid position. When are we in this position? Now, I often say if I walked into a room and everybody was sitting like this, I think I'd come into a prayer meeting or a group of aliens because it's not a position we use a lot. What do you need your hand turned palm up for? Generally, there's only two things that I can ever really think of, although I'm sure people tell you for taking water, if you get, ever get water straight from a tap, which I don't think many of you do, but if you're going to get a handful of water or shampoo on your hair, that's a classic. How do you get shampoo on your hair if you can't get your hand that way? Well, that's pretty easy, actually. You pick up the bottle and you tip it on your hair. So as long as you, uh, or you get somebody else to do it for you, there's always that, of course. But you don't need to be able to put your shampoo there as long as you can squish the bottle, and get your hands up to do your hair. Or taking money, but that's easy because you just get them to hold the money out and you take it that way. So you can always get round not doing that activity, but actually for power, for, I know you don't turn book pages over anymore. It's all this for turning book pages, but there are many things that you still need to do where you would turn over, particularly in the kitchen, if you're working. And young people, teenagers always think, what do I want in terms of a career where I may need some sort of arm or upper limb movement that would be useful. How would I use a camera if I needed a camera? Yes, there are many adaptations, but are the things I might need to use. We have people who are sound engineers. If you've got a lot of buttons and things and you need to twiddle dials, you still need to twiddle dials, surprisingly enough. Even on a microwave, some of them, you have to twiddle a dial. And that is a turning motion. So we need to think little things, including turning, are important. What about basic basics, using a pair of scissors? How often do we need to use a pair of scissors? Maybe we don't. 
But these activities, these basic activities are things that we can be practicing and doing that don't just involve pressing buttons on an Xbox or a telephone. And I'm afraid that we do find that a lot of children, particularly the nine to 15 year olds, are getting a little bit obsessed with telephones and Xboxes and televisions to the point where we are not using our hands enough. So then we get to school and we're tired and our shoulders ache and our arms ache and we can't do things. We do really need to be encouraging musical instruments, keyboards. We need to be encouraging or blowing something because that's good for your respiratory as well. We need to be encouraging self-care activities as much as we can. Squeezing your own toothpaste, even if you end up with a basin full of it. Doing things for yourself. And we need to be encouraging craft and, I know you're doing this, Marnie, craft and cooking and baking and all those sorts of things that will encourage hand activities. And that does not exclude the boys. There are plenty of things the boys can be doing as well. Electronics, boys can bake. In fact, um, I do know a young man who was furloughed during lockdown and has gone into baking and makes the most amazing bakes, cakes and biscuits. And I have seen on the internet, a few of the creations that have come out of a few kitchens. Um, you think of the top chefs, look at MasterChef, they're all men. I mean, come on, the presenters are both men. And if you can't be a chef, go and be a restaurant critic because all you end up doing is being fed loads and loads of good food by the looks of things. So don't worry, boys, you may end up being a restaurant critic if you can't be a chef. We need to think arms. Any questions, Marnie? We have, we've got a few. Um, so someone's actually, it's not a question, but um, a statement saying, I've seen some kids now using virtual reality headset games where the game involves gripping and turning with functional activities. So they might be good to look into for people with SMA. It might indeed. And one hopes that people don't lose interest in it because we know when the Wii first came out and people were doing boxing games and all sorts of lovely things on the Wii. And that really has lost a lot of following, which is a shame because the boxing is amazing. And quite a lot of the activities on that are the sort of things that we still want to be doing. So yes, um, apart from just doing an Xbox, there's all sorts of nice things that you can be doing electronically with the um, kinematic stuff. And yeah, do it, do it. If, if The only thing I would say is be careful with those headsets because if you are a little bit weak on your head, you'll end up tipped to one side and find your world's actually on its side a bit. Um, make sure you do get a lightweight headset and make sure you are able to wear it quite symmetrically. And make sure all the wires are out of the way. I had one on and I was looking around, like I think I was in, I was underwater with sharks and I was looking around, turned my chair around, ran over the cable, pulled it out the headset, everything went blank. It wasn't mine, so I was like, oh no, I've broken it. So do be careful. And that's the same with helmets, people. If you are a type three and you are wearing, if you're doing any cycling, and I know there are some type threes who cycle, even on tricycles and electric bikes, can you please make sure your helmet fits properly and it isn't skewed to one side or too far back or too far forward? Um, it's a bit like, no, I won't say it. I was gonna say something with a hole in. Um, don't wear a helmet if it's not on properly. More questions, Marnie. <laughs> How can my granddaughter lift her arms, which she seems to have difficulty doing on her own? She is four. Now, the problem is the weight of the arms is big. And you need to think about starting, as, as we've said in the past, in anti-gravity positions. So instead of just working to go here and we know because I've got my bag of tricks with me so I hope I've got some parabands in there well Marion they've just added that she's type one okay here's me bit of theraband it's 
a long bit of TheraBand. So we know now, if she's a type one in this country, she will have had the chop done more than once. And the chop looks at arm function. Now, one of the things that you do with chop, that's there's, there's several, I don't like the chop as an assessment. It's a bit naff, but as a way of doing exercise, it's really quite nice. So one of the items of the chop is to put a pen in someone's hand and get them to grip and lift their hand up. So what you're doing is you're encouraging them to hold on while you're actually doing the lifting and stopping the hands slipping up. So you can do that as an exercise or an activity of giving them something in their hand and trying not let them pull it out. So the arm is up in the air, but you can also encourage them to push and you could get a little bar. That's actually um, a bamboo skewer. So you could get something like a bamboo skewer or the other thing you can do is if you go to Waitrose for your sushi, you can get the chopsticks and encourage them to be pushing up, holding on if she's got a reasonable grip, she can hold on with your help, you hold it and she can be helping you to push up so that she's using that grip to help work her arms and her shoulders. So that's one activity. You can put bells on, you can make it jingle, you can have fun things on there, you can get her to reach, you can get her up in the air and try and take one hand off. Use your imagination. The other thing that uh, the chop does is it has you lying on one side and moving your arm off your side and trying to keep it up in the air. So that's something that you can be doing that encourages arm movement that is not up this way but that is lying on your side and lifting it out to the side or lying on your side and lifting it forwards and trying to keep it up from falling onto the bed or onto the mat or onto the floor so using those activities now you can be on your back lying down doing activities you can use the theraband as a sling you can use a scarf you can use an old pair of tights to take the weight of the arm and let her swing and reach for things. You could have a bar suspended somewhere with things that she can pull down or again on elastic to give her some resistance so that although she's pulling down, you're lifting her arm up, although she's pulling down, either she's using the resistance of the TheraBand or the resistance of whatever you've strung up on elastic. So there's many ways of supporting the arm, but making it work. Okay, um, we've got a comment question, which we can answer very quickly, because we were just talking about this before the live, saying on the stretching of the lungs comment, wondered if this could be a webinar topic one time, if it hasn't been already, stretches and exercises to help with breathing, or is that too respiratory-esque? We are trying so currently sorting out a respiratory-based webinar, so we'll be advertising that very soon. Um, so why not? Yes, yeah, stretching the trunk. Can I just say, Marnie, stretching the yeah. trunk is a good way of encouraging uh, better respiratory. But if you really want a good respiratory exercise, there are games and activities you can play. And one of the best respiratory exercises is singing and actually properly singing. And I don't mean just, <gasps> but actually doing proper singing lessons or singing activities where you're learning to breath control to sing. Another good thing, again, as I say, <coughs> is get out the old school recorder because it's quite light or get out a kazoo and see how long you can blow. So there are, <coughs> excuse me, just having some breathing exercises. Um, there are breathing activities that you can do. Blowing games, we've talked about this before, getting straws, playing blow football with straws. <laughs> we have an intruding cat, unlike the intruding dog who has been, I think, throttled at the moment to stop him barking. You can play 
blow football with cotton wool balls. You can, you know, we've done quite a lot of activities. Why am I sitting here with a pack of cotton wool balls? Please do not ask. There's many things you can do with a cotton wool ball. You don't even need a straw. You can just blow it across the table. Um, but a straw is really nice because what people forget is when you're breathing, doing breathing exercises, not just about breathing out, it's about breathing in as well. So the beauty of doing stuff with a straw is that you can actually suck up and try and pick up the cotton wool ball and move it somewhere. Blow football, blowing games, musical instruments, get a mouth organ because you suck and blow in a mouth organ. Lots and lots of things you can be doing, but certainly stretching does help to increase your, your capacity by opening up your chest wall. So yes, absolutely, get moving. This is why swimming works, because when you're swimming, you are moving that chest quite a lot. There's quite a lot of work on just rotating the spine, stretching the spine sideways, very much Pilates style exercises. Now, if you are older, look on YouTube. There is Pilates in neuromuscular disorders done by um, three or four physiotherapists have got together and have put Pilates. Um, let me just have a look. It's on YouTube. I think it's neuromuscular. Um, I'm sure you can look it up, but it's on YouTube. They're all available. There's mat, the sitting and standing, I think they've done. Um, but it's on YouTube for bigger people. Neuromuscular Pilates. Ooh. Pilates, oh, there's all sorts on here. Yes, Pilates video in line for people with neuromuscular conditions in sitting and in standing. It's done by University College Hospital. I'll show you what we have here. Um, hang on, I need to unplug my phone. The lady in the middle is a lady called Jo, who is, for those of you who go to King's, she's brilliant. That's, and they're, so those are online. They do a lot of work on trunk and on getting all that stuff. So for the older ones among you, it's not a little East thing, but it's definitely a sort of teenage and adult thing. Have a look at the Pilates videos. Okay, so my dad has just rescued me from the cat. So we are all good. Oh, the other way around. Has your dad just rescued the cat from you? <laughs> no, she was trying to like attack my laptop. She's the aggressor here, not me. A catastrophe. Oh, she's been laid on my bed all day. She's not moved until now. I wish. <laughs> okay, so when I do the exercise of turning my palms up, like turning a page, I feel my back muscles engaging to help. Should I try to allow my back muscles to help me with that movement or try to keep my back muscles still while turning my hands up? The problem is if you're using your back, you're twisting your whole back. This is what you're doing. You're taking your hand and you're using your trunk to help you twist. So while it's nice that your back muscles are working, it's not doing enough for your hand. So I would try a mixture. Try at some point to stabilize your back, sit right back against your chair and don't let it move and then just use your hand. And at other points you could maybe do this, but basically it's a cheating thing. It's like when you're trying to lift your arms up in the air and you've got your arms to here and you just go wee and up come your arms. So actually you're not lifting your arms, you're just leaning backwards. Same idea, what you are doing is you are actually rolling to help you turn your hand over. So try and stabilize yourself, sitting right back in your chair, have yourself as solid as possible, and then try and make the movement from your arm. And if you really want to avoid your back being involved, stick your hand on the table, right from the elbow down, and do it just turning your hand on the table, and that should stop. You'll feel your back muscles wanting to help, but hopefully it will prevent them doing the actual movement of twist. Okay. Um, in the case of when they show a lot of 
trunk extensions compensate when lifting overhead? Do you encourage supporting the back or keeping the range of motion where they don't compensate? The, the point is what you're trying to achieve. If you want to increase the amount of movement you get, if you can only get to shoulder level before you start swinging backwards and you can't progress from there, you have to think of a way of doing it. Because by just leaning backwards, it's not actually exercising your arm muscles. So you can keep working to here, but if you wanna progress, look at something like crawling up a wall or putting something on the table and crawling it up, trying to work that hand upwards you may start off with a slope, we've talked about this before, of actually having a tray or something where you can work up and reach upwards. You can have a piece of equipment, you can have, you're gonna to have to think about something that you've got in the house that you can actually use to slide your arm up higher. As I say, everybody's got a few Amazon boxes you can chop up and use and make into something that you can use to slide your arms up. But ideally, if you get to a certain point where you're always going to be leaning back to get your arms up, you are not exercising your shoulders. Okay. Um, what about exercises for stretching out the back, in particular where there is kyphosis and scoliosis? Well, this depends on age, because if you're older, you're going to find it much more difficult. And if we're talking about littlies, the best place to do those sort of stretches are over balls, rolls and peanuts. There is no doubt that this is where you're going to get the best work. You can do work on rolling. You can keep the pelvis still and roll from the arm or you can keep the arm still and roll from the pelvis is another way of stretching the back. Good sitting will help to stretch out the back. You can stretch. On, as I say, on balls, on peanuts, you can do exercises where you're pushing backwards. You can lie over a semi-roll. If you have a semi-roll, if you're a bit older, the half rolls that you can get for Pilates or yoga, you can get a squishy ball and put it under the shoulder blades, actually works to stretch. It's gotta be fairly squishy. We're not talking about basketball type stuff and we're not talking enormous, but some a fairly squishy sponge ball, about that big, whatever that big is. What's that about? Ooh, about 10 centimeters yeah. in diameter. Squishy sponge ball, stick it, lie down on it and stick it under your shoulder blades and stretch over that. Okay. Um, we've got a question from SMA Island. So SMA Island have been in touch with a question um, and they have asked about body suits in terms of positioning and strengthening. Um, they're not body suits with plastic supports, just lycra zip ups for the entire body. Are they a help or a hindrance? Well, if you've ever tried to get them on an SMA child, I don't think it's the easiest thing in the world to do because a bendy little bunny is not easy to get into a Lycra suit. If you think, those of you who wear fairly tough Lycra leggings, they are a sod to get on and a bigger sod to get off. Um, if you are thinking about the effect of Lycra, the question has to be, what are you using it for? It's not going to stop curvature of the spine, but if you are a little bit wibbly wobbly, it might help. But that is an awful lot of work to get a lycra top. And if it's got no boning and no extra support, what is it actually going to do? If you are asymmetrical, you will just squash it asymmetrically. We do recommend lycra but only in very few cases. And the only time we really recommend Lycra is Lycra shorts. We like Lycra shorts for the SMA threes who've got very wobbly hips. So they've got a lot of movement around the hips and find them unstable. That's uh, usually the weaker type threes and also some of the stronger type twos who are good enough to do some standing without cafos, 
but are still wobbly around the hips. And we do think Lycra shorts does help for those kids, but generally body suits are a pain. Um, they're hard to get on, they're harder to wee in, and they do not have a tummy hole. This is the big issue with Lycra. You cannot put a tummy hole in Lycra. So you are restricting the work of the diaphragm. So if there's any breathing problems, you are not going to make them better. Okay. Um, I want to limit transferring as much as possible to avoid any necessary, unnecessary contact. What physio can my child do in their chair? This will not be with the physio, but a TA, so I don't want anything too technical. Okay, now the, 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 the big question with that is, does the chair tilt in space? Because there's totally different things that you can do in the sitting upright position that you could do in the reclined position. Now, I know that there is recline and I know this, the whole seat goes backwards and forwards, but either way, whether it reclines or it tilts, you can do more when you're lying back because your, your trunk and your head are supported, which gives your arms and legs more opportunity to work. Very hard to work sitting to do more than just from the knees, but you can do a bit of hip work. You can do some rolling in and out and stuff in the reclined position or in the tilt position that you can't do. So you can do any arm work in sitting, but again, obviously it's harder to take your arms behind you. And that's an important one for wheeling a wheelchair or wheeling a dynamic stander. So there is, we, we tend to forget the idea of taking our arms behind us, particularly if the back of the wheelchair is gonna get in the way. So that's the sort of exercise you should be doing in sideline or unsupported sitting. Better in side lying, going, taking that arm right back behind you, unless you have a low back to wheelchair, and that's usually good, just the good type twos and the type threes, you'd have a lower back wheelchair where you can do either the, um, the archery style. This is one exercise we really like, is this archery style exercise, but you need the space behind you. You can't do that if your wheelchair is gonna get in the way. So this is a lovely one for going backwards. And again, really important for posture and shoulders. Bit more difficult in the chair, but you can at least start further forwards and come back as far as the back of the chair. You can do all the stuff with the bands up, take your arms up, take them down. You can tie your legs together and squash your legs apart. You can tie your feet together, do things with your feet. You can tie it to the chair and do kicking forwards. So there's a lot of opportunity where you don't have to come out of the chair with a bit of TheraBand to do lots of fun and nice exercise, arms and legs. You can do twisting in the chair. You can do leaning in the chair, depending on whether you've got a spinal jacket on and how much spinal mobility you've got. You can do breathing exercises in the chair. You can certainly do head exercises. You can do all the boxing stuff everything that would include boxing, punching up, down, sideways. You can do chair dancing. You can get the music on and get the old TikTok on and get moving. There are no end of activities you can do that do not require coming out of the chair. Okay. Um, I want my child to write. You have covered this slightly, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Um, but also want him to keep up with school and writing does keep him behind. Do you recommend a mixture of typing and writing? And can you recommend any good grips for pens? Grips for pens really is OT um, or school. So you really need to either speak to school and see what they usually put in place or the OT needs to go into school and have a look at the difficulties with writing. Um, there are many different types of grips. If you look at some of the educational catalogues, you will see um, that they have special pen grips. You can try the chunky pens. There are tripod grips. Uh, the tripod grips you used to be able to get very easily in just in the shops and just stick them on. The alternative is to get some sort of tubing 
uh, the sort of stuff you put around radiator pipes, that's quite a nice one just to stick on a pen. Also quite easy to put from pen to pen. So the one for the narrow pipes will go on a pen. You can get even simple pens like this, where's the camera gone, that have a chunkier end than the thin ones. And that's a non-slip chunky end that you get. This is a big grip, but you can get chunkier ones like this. Depending on the age, chunky crayons, but you are right. There should be a nice mixture of writing and typing. The other thing to remember people is to get speed typing skills. So what you want to do is not have the plonk, 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 or the plonk, plonk, plonk that you have on a phone, but actually be in touch with school. They should be able to put you on to good apps for speed typing skills. And they can do it through games. It's not just about doing it through writing an essay or writing the lazy cat jumped over the quick brown fox or whatever it is that you do. Um, but there are apps that are games to learn speed typing because it's no good saying, well, we'll do lots of typing if it's one finger, one finger, one finger. But certainly the grips, you need to speak to your OT if you can't find grips commercially. Okay, um, I have really come on with my head strength since starting Vista Plan. Um, but the physio has been intense. My partner who helped me is returning to work. What can I do myself to keep this strength that does not require extra help? Okay, now there's the, the bog standard basic one is the one where you're pushing backwards into the pillow or the back of your chair. And that's just basic while you're sitting in the chair. You can get something behind your head like a whoopee cushion or something squeaky. Um, again, a squishy sponge ball. Now, one of the reasons that you would put something in behind your head would be at a cushion or a ball is that will bring your head forward and you will be working in a different range. So if you push your head back into the back of the chair, you're working where your head is sitting on the chair. But if you then put a cushion or a squashy ball, you've brought your head forward and your muscles are working in a different position and different parts of the muscle are working. So bring your head forward and push back. So if you can get a cushion or a ball or a balloon in behind you, fairly tough balloon, like one of the big helium balloons, not something that's gonna pop the minute you do it, but, and then push. And then even if you're further forwards and push, don't forget sideways, your head goes backwards and forwards, side, 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 side. And then they have what we call the four quadrants, which is up to one side, up to the other side, down to that side and down to that side. So don't forget all those movements. Now, what you need to do, you need to join the craft group, you need to make yourself a headband, you need to make yourself a second one and then put some weights in it. Because what you could do is actually make a headband or your partner can, fill it with a bit of sand so you've got your headband on and you've got some sand in it. And actually what you've done is you've made yourself like a head weight and you can do exercises with a little head weight. So you can make yourself a head weight, not as crazy as it sounds. It doesn't have to be a ton of something. It could be a, just a few lentils. You could put it at the front. You could put the band at the back, you could put it at the side so that you're doing the sides. So don't forget there's you can weight something that you've got on your head. You could wear a cap with a ton of weight in. I don't know, you can do all sorts of things. The other thing to think of it is different positions for your head. So sitting is only one position, lying, lying on your side. And if you can get into a position where you're on your front so that you're working your head up against gravity that way as well. But don't use the elastic bands for your head because apart from the fact they can pull your hair, you don't want to have any pinging into your face. So please don't use the bands for your head. You can use a scarf or you could use something reasonably secure. You can get, I haven't got it here, but there's a, um, a band that is much more like a thick elastic that they use for Pilates, which you could use, but please don't use this sort of TheraBand stuff 
near your head because it's not very nice if it pings and it also, as I say, gets stuck on your hair. Absolutely. Um, what might your recommendation be We fatigue? My son is 16, type three. We rotate exercises, legs, arms, trunk, with a goal of one hour a day. There are days he is still very tired. He wants to push himself and sometimes pushes himself too much. What might be an exercise schedule? There's so much that needs to be addressed. Well, the first thing I would say, and I don't know which of you out there are on um, salbutamol or albuterol as the Americans call it, but that is one way that some of the type threes find the fatigue is reduced if they're not on drug therapies yet. If he's a non-ambulant three, then he may not be. If he's an ambulant three, he may well be getting a uh, new sinusin, hopefully. Um, and one would hope, because what a lot of people say is that it does help with the fatigue. But the most important thing to think about with fatigue is the number of repetitions and the number, the amount of resistance. Firstly, alternate your exercises. Do not do the same exercise program every day. Concentrate on different parts of the body on different days so that you may do arms one day, legs one day, head and trunk another day, and then do that as a different exercise. Don't always go for power and uh, resistance, go for repetitions. So what you do is you work on building up the number at low power, and that is less fatiguing than trying to build up power. So you may start off doing 10 reps, do not increase the resistance of whatever you're doing. Do not increase the weight that you're using and go up to 15 reps, then go up to 20 reps. Then come back to 10 reps with a little bit more resistance, but only build up slowly to the point where there's no fatigue. If you're fatiguing by increasing the reps or increasing the resistance or weight, then you need to stop at that until you stop fatiguing and then progress from there. But alternate the activities when pools open. Do not try an activity program on the same days you go swimming. Do not do a program on the same days you do pee at school. And if you see a physio with any regularity, which would be a rarity, but just in case, do not expect to do a program on the same day as physio. So think about what you're doing. Maybe keep more of the activity till the weekends, particularly when you're going back to school, and try and do a little bit more on Saturday and Sunday and a little bit less during the week. Okay, um, we find that most physio requires us to remove our daughter's orthotics and then she's reluctant to have them back on. Um, is it more beneficial to be wearing the capos regularly or doing the physio or is it the balance? Um, now that's an interesting question because it depends on what they're doing. Now, in that situation, if I had a child who didn't want to do their exercise, didn't put, want to put their orthotics back on after their exercise, I would do all the work that I wanted to do in the cafos first. So if I was doing standing, all that standing in the cafos would be done first, and then I'd take them off and do the rest of the exercises. I think there is a balance to be struck. And I think, you know, we have to see what, it's hard to actually be, definite with your child because I don't know what the priorities of management are I don't know what is important to you and I don't know at what point she is in terms of what activity she can do but I think if she's reluctant to put them back on firstly you need to find out why what is it that is she too tired to put them back on are they uncomfortable after she's done her exercises does she just want that freedom of being out of them but if it was a little girl or a child that I was treating, I don't know why I said girl, could be a boy. It just seem to have more girls in cafes than boys at the moment. Um, I would do all the work I wanted to do in the cafes, then take them off and then do every all the other work out. And it may well be that you can substitute some of the activities um, by doing some work over a ball or over a peanut as well that would simulate 
sort of having the cathodes, but why she's reluctant to put them back on, I don't know. I can understand a lot of our kids don't want to. They come into physio, they do a bit of work in their cathodes, and when they go back out of the room, they don't want them back on. I understand that. It's a bit like having a horrible pair of shoes on. The mum has just recommended saying she just doesn't like wearing them. Um, I think there's a question there, and the question has to be why. Are they uncomfortable? Are they difficult? Do they get in the way? Does she find them too hard? And I think that's something that you need to discuss with your physio because most of our kids do like them. They like the, the ability to be able to stand and like the feeling it gives them. If they hurt, nobody's gonna want to wear them. If they squash your knees or if they're tight round your ankles or if you're scared, and you know, fear is a big issue. If you're standing in them and you're always think you're going to fall over in them then you don't want to do it so you really need to find out find out why she doesn't like them and see what can be done about it we i must admit most of our kids do like them yeah, she's commented again saying she likes the freedom of movement no i understand that but then there's there's a balance to be struck because one of the things about cathos is it really works for trunk and pelvis okay um in terms of weight bearing what can you do whilst your child is waiting for orthotics? I haven't had any orthotics for over a year. Oh dear. Well, there's no real excuse to that because if our kids don't have their cathodes, then we give them gaiters. Um, and most of the kids can stand in gaiters depending on how big and how heavy and how contracted they are. But it's really difficult if you haven't had anything to stand in. Now, some people will stand in standing frames with orthotics and some are doing freestanding. So it depends on what you're doing. Our orthotic service has been open the whole of lockdown and we are not unique. Other orthotic services have been working. So I'm afraid it's a bad excuse um, to say that it's lockdown's fault. We have not missed a, an orthotic clinic since last March. We have never closed. Um, yes, we have a remarkable orthotic service. Uh, you cannot say anything bad about them. They are amazing, but we are not the only hospital that's had an orthotic service. I know a lot of orthotic services have not been working during lockdown, but I don't know. I can't find an excuse for it. And I, I really think this is a, is a complaint issue because if you really need them, you need them. And we saw them as an essential part of the management of the children and something that wasn't to be stopped just because of COVID. Okay. And um, how often should your child do physio? Every day. Next question. No, because one of the things that I have said all the way along right from the beginning, physio should not be seen as some sort of exercise program to be fitted in at X hour during the day. Physio should be sport, activity, play built into everyday living. We do self stretches when we're cleaning our teeth. We do activity when we're rolling in bed. This is what I said right at the beginning. Every time you do something for your child that they could have tried to do for themselves, even if they don't succeed, you are taking away an opportunity to exercise. Physio is part of every day. Admittedly, you do need to get your hands on for stretches, but these should be active stretches and again can be built into daily activities. You can be doing arm stretches when you're putting jumpers on. You can be doing knee stretches when you're putting trousers on. You can be doing hip exercises when you're changing nappies or bums or cleaning people. There is no reason why you have to think of physio as a program at a specific time during the day. Physio is any sport activity play you can build in as much as possible. Okay. Um, sorry, I've just, my dad's written out some questions for me that we got sent ahead of time and I'm trying to read them. He's got interesting handwriting. Um, my child has been standing daily, but with returning to school, I feel like to do it daily after a full day of school will be too much. Would three times per week be okay? What about before school? We have some kids who stand for their breakfast when they're bright and breezy and everything's hunky-dory. Now I know there are families who don't have time in the mornings for standing for breakfast, but there are other families who do manage standing for breakfast. So you could do it in the morning. I accept 
most children will be tired at the end of a school day. So yeah, but then you could maybe, as I say, do it three times a week instead of every day, cut out the day when they have PE or physio. So that's one less. And then maybe do an extra session over the weekend if you're worried about reducing. So do two, say on a Saturday or a Sunday. Okay. Um, the school has offered to buy anything small to help with PE or physio. Any ideas of what they could buy? No, because I've got no idea how old your child is and what sort of activities they get up to, whether your child comes out of their chair during a PE, and I'd need a lot more information. I mean, a punch bag, something that they could hang on the ceiling, a therapy ball. I have no concept of what this child can be doing. And you can have the standing punch bags, you could have a, um, a portable basketball net because a lot of gyms will have a fixed basketball net that's too high. So you could get one of those more uh, mobile basketball nets that could be brought down lower for doing lots of catching and throwing. Um, all sorts of things that you could think of that you could use that wouldn't be big and expensive. But certainly a basketball, one of the adjustable height basketball things that um, is not up high where everybody else is or netball ring that are way out of reach of a lot of wheelchair children. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. So I've been typing and typing and typing for uh, projects. And I think the other day, I think I typed up something like 20,000 words. Oh my God, I've been doing 4,000, it's taken me all weekend. Yeah, I just kept going and going and going until my hands literally wouldn't move anymore. And then I worried that I'd overdone it. So what kind of is, it sounds like what's the hint to stop before your hands just stop working? The problem is with fatigue is that sometimes it doesn't sort of creep up on you, it just happens. And I think what you have basically said is that you know now where your limit is. That, you know, some people would say 20,000 words, some people would say X hours. I think there's two aspects to this. You shouldn't keep going continuously. Um, you should try and think about breaks always for everything. It's not, firstly, it's not just your hands that are gonna suffer. If you're stuck in one position writing 20,000 words, that is a hell of a lot of typing and if you are doing that sort of thing, it's not just about your hands fatiguing. It's everything that's going on, plus your eyes, plus your head. And I think you need to be aware that you should be stopping. And this is not strictly physio. This is work ergonomics. All these work apps will tell you you should stop. You should move. You should change position. You should leave the room and come back. You should drink you should have breaks and that's the important thing because sometimes by having breaks you then when you start again you see what your level is fatigue is and it's by not stopping that you suddenly go ah yeah. and, and stand up whereas when you have breaks you will find when you start again how tired your hands are so do build those breaks in and have the rest because it is really important for everything oh yeah i did have the rest like I would do like 30 to 40 minutes and then stop and have a cup of tea. And then but at that point, that. you should sort of evaluate your hands and see yeah. how they're feeling. And what you haven't done is you've just gone bashing in again mm -hmm. without thinking, how are my hands? How are they feeling? Yeah. I woke One up of the things today, to be fair, I woke up the next day and my arms felt fine. I went to bed thinking, oh gosh, am I going to wake up tomorrow and not be able to do anything? Um, but. The other thing is when your hands get really fatigued, you know, those sort of like mask things that are a bit like wax that you can put on your hands, you get them for your skin, you can get them for your feet as well. And they're really soothing and nice for, or just a bowl of warm water with some oil in, yeah. just to loosen you up afterwards. And when typing, I've noticed my fingers, can you see they're kind of cross? Yeah. Do I need to stop them doing that? Well, you're doing that because that's weakness. And basically they're crossing to stabilize each other. So what they're doing is they're supporting each other when you're doing that. So it's a bit like saying two is better than one, 
because it's two muscles, two lots of muscles help supporting you. If you try and stop it, you'll fatigue quicker. Okay. So is that where taping has come in? Yeah, it can do. Yeah. It can do. But if you try, it's like all compensatory movements. The whole point of compensatory movements is to reinforce the movement using something else. So that if something's not working, and that goes for people without SMA, you know, if I need, it's like the jar opening, you know, when you, you, you're opening a jar and your face goes, this is called reinforcement, but also you will compensate. You will compensate by, you know, this whole idea of moving your whole body or doing strange movements to get extra power in there and if you try and stop it the movement will be less effective so in a lot of compensatory movements unless it really affects posture and that's why with the writing when you're really making a lot of effort and it affects your posture we will try and change that by typing but there are times when you can't suddenly just change what you're doing to stop the compensation but with little children, this whole thing with compensation, we really need to see how it impacts on posture. And that's the important thing, because we know posture is a big problem for a lot of the kids. And this is what leads to asymmetry and scoliosis and back problems and all sorts of things. So fine to compensate and fine if two fingers are crossing or fine if your legs are doing strange things. But when it comes to your spine, particularly when you're young, then you have to think about these compensations and try and find alternatives. Okay. Um, and do you have any tips for adults who are like going back to work, doing the nine till five, typical one hour break that they want to actually use as a break and not use to do physio? Any tips on how they can just tie it in to almost do while they're working but not disrupt their work? Again, it will depend very much on what the work is. But we're back to this. If you have your legs tied together, you can be doing a little bit of getting your legs squished outwards. If you have some tied to your chair and you can just get somebody to slip a foot through and be doing a little bit of kicking under the desk so that you're working your quadriceps muscle or you're pulling your toes up because it's attached somewhere where you can pull your toes up. Somebody can just sort of stick it on your arm and you can do a little bit of your, this while you're watching a, a Zoom meeting with the video switched off, you know? I mean, that is the beauty of, of Zoom, really. If you switch the video off, you could be doing anything. You could be wearing anything, admittedly. But if you're just sitting in a meeting doing nothing but listening on a Zoom, switch your video off for a while and get your TheraBand out. There's lots of ways you can get around it. Okay. Um, someone's just commented uh, when you're on about uh, crossing fingers and things and other compensation saying, ah, that is why George crosses his big toe. He has to have a sock in between his big toe and second toe at night. <laughs> And um, also, it's a concern I've had, and I know it'll just be a case of building it back up, but I've been in the car for long periods of time, and at, when I say long periods of time, more than 15 minutes, twice in a year, and it's about building that back up, and is it best to start with support at first and slowly take it away, or just try to go for it and see what happens? I think it really depends on how far you're going, because ultimately, if you are the driver, you don't want it to impact on your driving. So you don't want to say, oh, should we just see how it goes when you're stranded in on the Yorkshire Moors and you think, oh, God, I, I'm too tired to drive back home again. So if you are the driver, you need to think very seriously about building up again, because if you are used to doing one hour journeys and the longest you've done during lockdown is down to Tesco's or gone to do something, you know, just put the dog in the boot and taking it out for a walk, then you really do need to think about how you're going to manage a longer journey than that. So yes, building up may be an issue because you don't want to be stranded or dread getting back in the car to come home in the evening. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a driver, but that is a really good point for those who are, because you definitely don't want to be stranded. Um, okay, I think that might be it for questions. Okay, so we've talked quite a lot about exercise. We haven't talked about stretches. 
because this is something, and don't forget those of you who've gone on to Ristaplam or are going on to Ristaplam, you can end up with more tightness. Now, I think virtually every adult who has commented on the Ristaplam has felt better on it. Not everybody has said they've suddenly, you know, done amazing things that we haven't got anybody tightrope walking, we haven't got anybody abseiling quite yet, but lots of extra stamina, lots of extra staying power, lots of extra managing. But do beware that if you are starting to build up muscle and those of you who are using machines or who are doing specific exercise programs, please do think about getting a bit tighter in your joints because some muscles are suddenly getting strong, but the opposite muscles are not. And we need to think about adults, particularly on wrist diplam. Children do it normally with a physio. It's the bane of mum's life. It's the bane of the kid's life. Dad hates it, but will jump in there gung-ho every so often. But adults, you need to be thinking about getting yourself some stretches one way or another. Stretching out in bed, reclining in your wheelchair and getting yourself stretched out. For those of you who can roll onto your fronts, and there won't be many of you, get on your front and have a stretch that way. Get your head stretched, get your neck stretched, get your shoulder stretches, get somebody to pull those arms up over your head and out to the side. Get those legs as straight as possible. Get those hips stretched outwards as well as inwards. Bend up and twist and really think about getting these joints stretched because what you do not want is to end up with nice strong muscles and nowhere to, to work them because you've got tighter as you've got stronger. So adults, please do not think that you can't get contractures. You will not get contractures through growth, but you can still get tighter if some muscles get stronger and others don't. So a good stretch at least once or twice a week is going to be beneficial for all of you. It does. I know that most adults do not have stretches regularly. Very few of you do. But get your carer to help you with your feet, with your knees, your hips. Before you get out of bed in the morning when you're nice and warm is always a good time. You don't want to because you don't want the covers off. You're all nice and snuggly and warm. But get those stretches done as much as you can. Because stretches, and as I say, active stretches, we don't talk about passive stretches. You've noticed I didn't say anything about passive. I didn't say active either, but I'm certainly not saying passive. If you can join in and help, do. If you can't, better to do, get somebody to do it with you. But if you can join in and help straighten your arm, help straighten your hip, help straighten your knee, doesn't have to be lots and lots of movement, just lots of thinking get that muscle relaxing, get that muscle stretched. Really, really important. One of the basics of physiotherapy, boring as hell, I accept, but stretches are so important and important for these adults on wrist plan. And the last thing is splinting. Now, I know from the comment tonight and from other services that orthotic services have been one of the ones that has been seen as not essential during lockdown and many services have really not been functioning but splints are quite important spinal jackets obviously have been really important and we've kept going with those but cafos foot splints all sorts of splints that you're using for the ambulant children, we if you have wobbly feet, we tend to use the trilock splints, but splints are still important. Elbows to try and stop your elbows getting tighter, knees to try and stop your knees getting tighter. We use what we call soft cast splints. We make them on the spot. They take no more than 20 minutes to send somebody home with a pair of splints just to stop you curling your knees up in bed, just to stop you sleeping with your arms up here and getting tighter elbows. And splinting is really important. Now, adults, I know that very few of you will get splints, but again, if you are going to a neuromuscular service to get your wrist diplam, ask them about splints. 
ask to see a physio. It is not unreasonable to ask for a physio review. You should be getting an assessment anyway prior to going on to risk diplom. Um, ideally, you should all have a physiotherapy assessment before you go on to risk diplom because you will not know what it's doing. And if NICE wants some evidence, they need evidence from you. So you may do an upper limb scale, you may do an EK scale. Those are the most common ones in adults. There is a horrible one, and I have to say this because I do think it's horrible, called a chop attend, which is for people who cannot sit independently. Um, I don't think it's the nicest scale I've ever seen. I'm not convinced that it's functional, but it is being used now and will be used more in this country. Uh, it was developed in the States, the chop attend for non-sitters, and that's of all ages, including adults. Um, so you may be asked to do that, but if you're doing assessments, ask about splints if you need them. Hand splints, wrist splints, knee splints, feet splints. There's no harm in asking. You might not get them, but if you can get them, so much the better. Any questions, Marnie? Um, we've had a comment saying, I have really noticed a stiffening in just a few months of wrist stretching just 20 to 30 minutes every day is really helping no it really is important i think adults feel that it's not going to happen to them um yeah. remember these are new drugs these are something you've never had before you haven't been able to make use of a drug can you hear that beastie uh, i'd rather have the cat um no, at least it wasn't making a noise <laughs> um you know we have to be careful because if you get contractures it's going to be almost impossible to get rid of them. Parents know, and I mean, so many of you adults know that you didn't do your stretches and you've ended up all stuck and squished. Well, this, these things happen. We know that. It doesn't necessarily mean that by having stretches, you will end up straight and beautiful. And I do know of possibly several children but two in particular spring to mind one of whom I do believe might even be on this webinar who as children got regular stretches and both of them a girl and a boy were as straight and straight as anything beautiful two parents who, who could only be said were dedicated to keeping these kids straight but ultimately being straight does not make you stronger but it does give you more room to move it gives you more range of movement it gives you more opportunity to move doesn't make your muscles stronger but wrist plan will we don't know what will happen with other drugs in the future we don't know what sort of combination drugs obviously wrist plan for a lot of adults is going to be first choice things like avexis the zol gensma will not be available the gene therapy as it is will not be available for adults, but we don't know that gene therapy won't be coming for adults in the future in some other form, that something like nusinersen may not be converted into um, some other form of drug. And so it may, it may well be that Ristiplam is not the only option for adults in the future, but we are not aware of what these drugs are gonna do for you adults. But we do know from years and years and years of experience that in virtually all other drug, drug trials, in olisoxime, in so many drug trials, in SMA and other things, have caused increasing contractures. And we really need to be aware that if you get tighter and you leave it, you will lose range, which ultimately will reduce your function. So you'll have the power and know where to use it. Yeah, I don't know if you'll say whether it's doing the right thing or not. I've tried to tie in doing the stretches within the exercises as well. Absolutely. As I push my arm out, because I'm pushing, whoever's helping me will then just push it that little bit further. So I'm still pushing and then they just push it that bit further. to give Well, it not only is it helping with your stretches, but it also is helping you be 
injured when you're stretching. One of the big problems that people have, um, particularly children, if you have been injured when you have been stretched, if you have been overstretched or hurt, then of course you're going to resist having stretches. But if you are working with the stretch as you are, Marnie, you are so much less likely to have an injury, which obviously is going to make you less reluctant to do it. If, if it's comfortable to do it, if it's positive to stretch, if it feels good to stretch, you're gonna do it. If somebody overstretches you or it hurts, then you're not gonna do it. And the, you know, there is something called the pain reaction. And when you have pain, your tendency is to curl up. You don't spread out like you just dropped out of a, an aeroplane and landed splat when you're in pain. When you're in pain, you curl up. There is, so there's always this tendency to come inwards when you're in pain, which is not helpful because that's where you get contracted. The other thing is you have a stretch reflex. And I know I've mentioned this before. In your tendons, there is a special little nerve receptor called a stretch reflex. And this is what happens when people test your reflexes, when they bang your patella, they're not banging your kneecap, they are banging the tendon under and what they are testing and this is what they call a spinal reflex and it bashes the tendon the tendon stretches when it gets bashed and it reacts by contracting which is why you should kick now a lot of people with SMA don't kick not because they haven't got the reflex but because they haven't got the power to kick so the one that they will test more often may be your biceps where they're looking so that you'll find your biceps tendon tucked in your elbow there and they'll stick their thumb on and then hit that with a hammer and the idea is that your muscle will do that that's your stretch reflex and if you overstretch or you stretch too fast your stretch reflex will take over it will pull you in the opposite direction to that of the stretch and then you will get an injury so always beware that when you're stretching you should do it slowly and you should do it, always stretch in line with the movement. There's no point in trying to stretch if that's not the way the movement goes. So there's no point in pulling the elbow out over to the side when it wants to go straight. And pretty much the same with the feet. When the feet are twisting inwards, that is not going to pull up. It's really important that if you're trying to stretch the tendon at the back of the ankle without sticking my foot up on the table, it's pretty hard to show you. I do have Dolly here. The whole point is let's, let's get the one that isn't taped. Okay, so what you're trying to do is stretch the tendon right at the back here. But if the foot is twisting in, you need to get the heel in the middle before you can stretch the tendon at the back. If the heel is twisted inwards, there is no point in trying to pull it up because you will get, you can damage some of the tendons around the ankle joint. There are two joints here. There's the ankle, which is up and down and the heel, which is in and out. So if you're stretching here, you need that heel in the middle. So it's heel in the middle first and then stretch. And that is so important and slow in SMA, adults and children, always stretch slowly and let the person you're working with relax and work with you. If you do it too fast, very hard to relax. Any last questions, Marnie, because we're running out of time. I don't think we can let people post them in the next 10 seconds. Otherwise okay. They know. <laughs> right, so think about your stretches, continue with the exercise and activity, and think about splints if you need them, because you cannot maintain a good position the whole time, particularly for feet. If you are one of these who sleeps with your elbows up here at night, you may well find that an elbow splint at night. If you have painful knees, now this is really important because there are a lot of people out there who get quite a lot of pain in their knees, then sometimes the best medicine for that is not medicine it is resting splints and very often when your knees are really painful if you're one of these who has low bone density and you've got painful knees rest is by far the best way of managing them now i know there are a lot of people out there who have hip pain 
I know that a lot of that hip pain is post-spinal surgery, and a lot of people end up with hip pain after spinal surgery. Another good reason for stretching before spinal surgery, even when those hips are dislocated, keep stretching because what we are trying to do is keep the hips as symmetrical as possible. Because what happens is if you're constantly sit sit sitting on one bum cheek and then they straighten your spine and your whole weight is shifted so that you're sitting on two hips rather than the one that you preferred before, then obviously you are changing your weight bearing surface. You are changing the way you are weight bearing through your hips. And this is what can lead to the pain because your whole weight bearing is completely different and if you don't understand that sit in a totally different position really swing over to the opposite side and see how quickly it becomes uncomfortable even in the normal situation and how do we know in the normal situation that it gets uncomfortable because if you've ever watched a room full of people they start off straight and then they'll cross one leg over and then they'll cross the other leg over and then they'll slop to one side and then they'll slop to the other side I have lectured on more than one occasion where I have said to everybody in the room, sit up straight and stay sitting up straight for the whole of the time I'm talking. And within two minutes, they've slopped to the side, they've crossed a leg over, they've moved their feet. So we know that it's changing position because you do get uncomfortable. But when you can't change position because you'll fall over or your jacket's on or your seating system and your bum stuck in that little dip and you're stuck in one position and then suddenly somebody comes along and straightens you back and puts you into a totally different position and your hips then become painful. You need to keep up those hip stretches to try and, and reduce hip pain, even if your hips are dislocated or subluxed. What would you say, personal question again? Yep, it's fine because I'm sure there's other people thinking the same thing. And it's aggravating sciatica. Because I know, like, if I aggravate my sciatica, I then don't sleep, I then get sick, and it's like a downward spiral. Yeah. So what would you say in that situation? Well, the problem with sciatica is if it's true sciatica, then you've got um, that's coming from your back, not your hips. And the problem then is how far your spinal surgery goes down. Does it go all the way into your pelvis? Yeah. Um, and the problem then is, is the gap between where your spinal surgery finishes and your pelvis. And what you are getting is you are getting some nerve impingement somewhere in there. And you need to try and keep that part of your spine mobile. You need to try and do a little bit of exercise and a bit of wiggling. You need to try and do a little bit of stretching. And one of the things that you can do is try and tilt that pelvis and roll that pelvis into the gap. And that is one way of doing it. The other way is what we call traction. And that's when somebody literally, you're holding on at this end and you are gently pulling your pelvis down. And that's what we call distraction. And that is stretching that last little bit of your spine to take some of the pressure off the sciatic nerve. So you can do that. And another way of doing that is to have your knees quite far bent up and then you're trying to roll your pelvis backwards. So somebody's holding your knees up and you're trying to flatten that last little bit of your spine or they can gently push those knees up towards your nose because you always think of stretching as coming down. But when you're trying to stretch the spine, the way to do it is to actually roll your bum upwards. So when you're trying to stretch that last little bit of your spine, it's not a case of getting your knees down. It's actually a case of trying to get your knees up and bring that pelvis round to pull the bottom part of your spine away from the bit that's fixed. So what you're doing probably is stretching your hips downwards instead of trying to pull your pelvis round and give yourself a bit of stretch in that low back. Yeah, that makes sense because when my dad lifts me, don't lift people, boys don't lift. Um, when my knees are right up, that's when I get relief. And I wish you could just hold me all the time. <laughs> Obviously you can't, but yeah, so that makes a lot of sense. Because pulling your leg down is squishing that last little bit of your spine. Yeah. It's pulling your hips down, which is great for stretching your hips, but it's not what you need, which is the stretch on that lumbar spine. So it's actually getting your knees up 
and pulling your bum round, if you see what I mean. You're trying to actually get your, you know, the bum, the bones in your bum. The bony bit, yeah. The bones in your bum. You actually want to sort of squish them so they're pointing up towards the ceiling. Okay. They won't, unless you're really bizarre. But that's the idea that you're trying to twist them up towards the ceiling to open up that bottom bit of your lumbar spine. So if you're getting sciatic pain, the last thing you want to be doing is squashing that bit. You want to be stretching that bit. And as I say, a bit of distraction. But sciatic pain is unusual because once you're fixed into your pelvis, you're stuck and there shouldn't be impingement. And it usually is more acute in those of you who finish about L3, L4. I think that's where mine finishes. Yeah. And that that's what we need to do is, is distract that bottom bit, your pelvis away from where it's fixed because something's squishing. Okay, and could that cause issues with, it's obviously saying pull the knees up, could that then cause tightness in the thighs? No, because all no. you're doing is doing it, you're only doing it temporarily just to relieve the pressure on the sciatic nerve. You're not, I'm not saying stay like that. No, no. Don't spend hours like that, <laughs> but it's just to, to relieve that pressure. Okay. That's okay. Well, I asked just before where we've reached tonight and a few comments have said we've reached Ireland, South Devon, all the way in Leeds, miles away, um, the USA, Canada and Lebanon, which is absolutely fantastic. So thank you for everyone for joining us. Okay, so we are hoping, as Marnie said, to bring you a respiratory um talk next week or in a couple of weeks time you will not be seeing me in two weeks time because it is my birthday and although i was supposed to be going away and i am not i am still not spending it with you lot much as i love you all i'm not oh, on that basis I I had a balloon arch ready and a confetti cannon. <laughs> and cakes. I want birthday cakes. I want everybody with a little cupcake with a candle in. <laughs> so it is likely, people, we will see you on the 28th of March. If not, we will see you around Easter time, but it's probably going to be the 28th. Some ideas and suggestions would be nice. Otherwise, you will just get me prattling on about whatever I want to prattle on about. Okay, until then, take care. Thanks a million, Marnie, for all your help. And we will see you all very soon. Take care. Thanks, Marion. Bye. Okay, bye.